Good afternoon, church. How are we doing today? Again, how are we doing today? One more time. How are we doing today? Good. It is once again certainly a blessing for all of us to be with each other once again. All of us to be worshiping together once again. As we now will be taking a look at our Christmas Sunday school lesson. Y'all know how much I love being able to teach our Christmas Sunday school lessons. And so I hope that you all will participate in with, with me in the teaching of our Sunday school lesson here for, for this week. The, the Light of Christmas. What we're going to do today is we're going to read the Sunday school lesson. We're going to read that scripture responsively. Okay, we didn't do our responsive reading earlier. We're going to do our responsive reading now. Andrew, is there another book back there? Yeah, another book. All right, yeah, go ahead and give me one because I want to read from the same scripture that all of you are reading from as well. Now, let us notice there that the lesson... It starts off in the first chapter of John. We're going to go from the first verse through the fifth verse. But then after we get from that fifth verse, we skip over to Ephesians. We skip to the fifth chapter. All right. Thank you. And we go from the first to the second verse. And then we again, we skip down to the sixth verse. And we'll go down through the 14th verse. All right. So if all of us, I just want to make sure that all of us are aware that there is a skip in scripture. Okay. All right. So all of us, we should be looking at that now. That's on page 19. If all of us are looking at it, let us say amen. 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 All right. We'll see that the scripture it reads, it says, In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. And the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given us, hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for our sweet smelling savior. Let no man deceive you with vain words for because of these things come the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light and altogether. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Amen. Amen. So our Sunday school lesson again for today, the light of Christmas. Now, what I really love about what our Sunday school lesson does for our Christmas Sunday school lesson this year is it takes a look again at something that I have been focusing in on a lot this season and something that I focus on every year for that matter when it comes to the holidays 
is I focus in on the reason for the season. Okay. So not only do we get to focus on the reason for the season, but we focus on something that I've essentially been preaching all year long, especially in the second half of the year or essentially the last quarter of this year to where we have been looking at our identity. All right. And how we are to, to be true to our identity and not act out of character. Okay. Y'all remember those sermons. I preached that in my series of sermons back in October about knowing who we are. So that's essentially what we focus in on in the second half of our Sunday school lesson here this week. But here in the first half, we go to familiar scripture from the first chapter of John's gospel. And we take a look at again, Jesus here. Well, we're told that in the opening verse, it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So we're told there in the beginning was the word and who was the word? God. Okay. We're told that the word was, we said the word was Jesus. Okay. We know that the word was Jesus, but we'll see that specifically in that first verse. We're told there that the word was God. Okay. So what I love so much about the first verse is that if you take a look at, uh, the, you see the, the 10th verse, we're told that, that he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. The 11th verse says he came to his own and his own did not receive him. The 12th verse says, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Then the 14th verse says this, the 14th verse says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. That's from the new King James version. Okay. So the word, all right, the word we know is speaking of a being, a person. This being we know is God. All right. We're told that again, the word there in the 14th verse, this being became a flesh and dwelt among his creation. That is us. All right. So again, we know that this, the word was of the only begotten or is the only begotten of God. And we know that the only begotten of God is Jesus. All right. So y'all have heard me teach this a lot of times, which is why I asked the question there in the first verse. And y'all said, well, the word is Jesus. We know that the word is Jesus because y'all have heard me, you know, teach and preach about this so many times. But there are many people out there that that don't know that that 14 verse. They've never seen that before. But Jesus is the word. All right. He was given to the world for a specific reason which is very interesting when we start talking about the word said there again, there in the first verse, it said in the beginning. Now let us not confuse this beginning with the essentially the beginning of time as we would think of the beginning of time. All right. That's not what is in mind there. All right. Because some of us, we would think, well, Jesus was made in the beginning. All right. No, Jesus was there before the beginning of time. All right. The Lord was there before the beginning of time. God is eternal. All right. So our rule set for time, you know, we, when we think of time, we think that time has a beginning and that time has an end. Right. But God is outside of our rule set for time. All right. When you take a look at in, in the book of Revelation, Jesus, he said that he is the Alpha and the Omega. All right. He said that he's the first and the last. He said he's the beginning and the end. You know, we think to ourselves, well, 
Well, how can he be those two things at the same time? Right? How can somebody be the first and the last at the same time? All right. How can someone be the beginning and the end at the same time? How can someone be the alpha and the omega at the same time? You know, that's that's what we begin to to think to ourselves. And, and essentially what Jesus is saying is that he's outside of our way of thinking when it comes to time. So, again, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Let us not. Let us not limit Jesus and let us not limit the Lord to our frame of mind. All right. He's beyond our way of thinking. All right. We see there in the second verse that second verse says there he was in the beginning with God. And the third verse says all things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. All right. So again, Jesus was present, all right, before time, before creation. Jesus was present. He is God. You know, we just finished, we just finished having that discussion about the Father and Son being one, which again is very confusing for, for many people. But again, God, we should understand, is the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Okay? All three work together as one. All right. Now there in the fourth verse, we'll see the John wrote of Jesus said in him was life and the life was the light of men. All right. So in him was life. Now, is that life John speaking about? Is he talking about physical life? What do y'all think? So in him was life. Is that life talking about physical life? What do y'all think? I mean, the, uh, uh, Come on, somebody help eternal, him out. Uh, eternal. Okay, eternal life. Spiritual. Spiritual. We're talking about real life. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, something that we have, you know, spoken above, we just talked about it as well, is that this life, it is temporary. Okay, we talked about this in our lesson last week where we were talking about being citizens of heaven, that our citizenship isn't in this world. As many of us would love to believe and think that we are citizens of this world. This world is a temporary home for us. OK, you know, we don't we don't essentially have a license in this world. We have a passport to be here. All right. You know, we, with a passport, you can go and visit a place, but you can't stay there. You got to get back home at some point in time. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. So we have a passport to, to be here. All right. But we aren't citizens of, of this place. We, we have a physical life. But sadly, this life physically is going to come to an end. All right. Then we move on to life eternal. All right. So we have to, again, be very conscious of that. But if you look at everything that John has said so far about Jesus here in this first chapter, where he said there again, he said in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. All right. Then he said there in the fourth verse, he said, in him was life. We have said here that this life is not talking about physical life. It's talking about spiritual, eternal life. OK, we see the divinity, the divine, the divineness, if that even is a word. OK, we see that of Christ. All right. Yes, Christ was born in the flesh. But he wasn't like necessarily wasn't like us. OK, he walked around as we do in the world. But Christ is divine. He's holy and he's righteous. <laughs> we ain't holy and righteous. We ain't divine. All right. We will see there. OK, in the fourth verse, it says 
in whom was life and the life was the light of men said there in the fifth verse says, and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. All right. So we start to see here light and darkness, right? Now, are we talking about physical light and physical darkness? What do y'all think? We're talking about spiritual still, right? All right. We're not talking about light radiating from the sun. All right. We're not talking about as if the sun somehow shut off and everything just went blackout dark. We're talking about, again, the light, which we know comes from the Lord. Jesus, when he was in the world, in the eighth chapter of John's gospel, we remember that Jesus said that he is the light of the world. Right. And so as the light of the world, what did Jesus do? What did he do as the light of the world? This starts to get us into the reason for the season. Why did Jesus come to this world? What did he do as the light of the world? To give us a chance, to, okay, to um, to um, have have eternal life. Okay, so okay, this answer we got that Jesus he gave himself, okay, to the world for us to have a chance for us to have an opportunity at life. What else did Jesus do as the light of the world? What does light do? Okay, guide. He guided us. All right. Go ahead, Brad. I was going to say he came to protect a lot of people, to change a lot of people. Okay. Uh, show them the correct way to go. All right, to show them the correct way to go. Okay, now we're, now we're really getting somewhere as well to add on to, to what Auntie said. Okay, so Jesus was given to the world because the world was in darkness. All right. Now, am I talking about the world being in physical darkness? Nope. How was the world in darkness? Okay, spiritual sin. All right. The world was in darkness and didn't even realize it was in darkness. You see, there, there, are, there are many people today that walk around in darkness. And they are happy to do so. They are living in sin. All right. But... It's a choice on many people's behalf to do just that. Because as the light of the world, as Brahari said, Jesus revealed the pathway, okay, to the heavenly kingdom. Jesus said that he is the way. He said that he is the truth, that he is, again, the life. All right. So Jesus has revealed he has revealed the knowledge of the holy truth, the divine truth. All right. Not some subjective truth. All right. He, he revealed to us the divine truth. All right. So we have knowledge of what is right and what is wrong. All right. Again, when we take a look at there, that fourth and fifth verse there. All right. John said in him was life, not death. When the world was in darkness, when the world was in sin, it was living in a manner that would lead to death. Now, I want you to understand, I ain't talking about physical death. I'm talking about the second death. The second death being the spiritual death, being cast away from God's presence for eternity. All right. So in him was life and the life was the light of men. All right. He revealed the way, the truth and the life that is, again, spiritual life. All right. We must live in obedience to Christ. All right. This is why Jesus was given to the world. This is why Jesus needed to be born in the world, because without him, we'd have been lost in darkness. 
we were lost in sin on a pathway to being eternally separated from the Lord, eternally cast away from the presence of God. All right. And we'll see there in the fifth verse. Where there in the fifth verse, it says, and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. All right. So again, there's a lot being said there in the fifth verse where again, the light is representative of the divine truth. All right. And said that the divine truth, it shined, but the darkness, which is sin, did not comprehend it. What does that mean to you all? That, that sin was not able to comprehend the divine truth. What does that mean to you all? What do y'all think about that? How can... I mean, they did not, uh, in other words, they did not see eye to eye. They, uh, uh, they, uh, light was looking at one thing, darkness was another. Okay. What do we add to that? Good answer. Does the sinner comprehend the divine truth today? No, no, no. no. Well, y'all answered that one right away. <laughs> All right, Sister, are you starting to speak? What, what else you say? I don't think they understand it. You know, uh, sometimes uh, if, you, if a person don't comprehend something, they'll think about it, but they don't understand it. And mm -hmm. they see people who are like... Uh, I would say we're all a sinner, but people who don't read the Bible or understand it, they don't, when you tell them there's something like they have, they don't, it's not comprehensive because they don't understand it. I think they don't have a, a tendency to understand what it's being said. They don't, mm -hmm. you know, look into it to see what it means. They just don't give it no thought to so mm -hmm. understand it. That's, that's often the case. People, there are many people who aren't open too trying to, to comprehend. All right. Now, something that, that all of us at one point in time, all of us was in darkness at one point in time. Okay. And we'll get to this in a moment here. All right. But we were open to receiving the light. All right. But there are many people who aren't open to receiving the light. All right. Y'all remember me preaching, uh, I think I preached this last week, where when we sound the trumpet, there are a lot of people that learn to ignore the trumpet. They, they learn to, to ignore when the watchman is standing on the wall and, and blowing the horn. Whereas there are many others that they can't ignore the noise. They, they, they hear the sounding of the trumpet and they say, oh man, that's a bunch of terrible noise. Stop that racket. Stop that fuss. Stop all of that mess. And they'll complain and they'll complain and they'll complain. That's what a lot of people are when it comes to the light of the world. You see, when, when Jesus entered the world and the world was in darkness, it was like turning on one of those lights. You know, when, when you are laying in a dark room and you sleep, and somebody just come in the room and they flip that light switch on. Even when you in deep sleep, you, you know, you, you, you. And, and, and many of us, you know, when we, when we sleep, when we sleeping like that, you know, we going to try to figure out a way to, to, to cover ourselves up from that, that light because we want to remain asleep. Right. You know, some of us, when that light, when it shine like that, we'll tell that person that flipped the light switch on and turn the light back out. You know, that, that's just too much brightness. All right. And so that's what happened with a lot of people where they lived in the darkness. They live by by the, the doctrine that is of the world and the light of the world shares a different doctrine that speaks against the doctrine that is of the world. You see, as the light of the world, Jesus, he revealed some truths, some very harsh truths about the world. Does anybody know what those hard that does anybody know what that one harsh truth is that Jesus revealed about the world? I say it often. 
what, what did what did Jesus reveal about the nature of the world? That it was sinful. I promise y'all ain't asking around rocket science questions. And so he revealed the that the world that we are sinners. And what is it that is promised to happen to the sinner? I've given this answer a lot already. What is going to happen to the sinner? You're going to be eternally separated from God or hell. Okay. And in the third chapter of John's gospel in 18 verse, all right, we'll see that those who are again, not of faith, that they choose to indulge in sin. Jesus said that they are condemned already. Okay. So Jesus, he revealed a rather harsh truth to the world. And there are many people today that don't want to hear that truth because there are many people today in their mind, they are perfect. But Jesus was given to the world. He was born to tell the world you ain't perfect. That's why he was born. That's why he was given to the world. Yes, he was given to the world to, to die for, for our sins, right? But he didn't just do that. Because it would have been easy for Jesus to have been born and then killed, right? That would have been easy to do. But, but he lived a life in between his birth and then his crucifixion, right? And, and within that time span, Jesus, he taught, all right? He taught us to, again, love the Lord with our whole heart, right? He taught us to, to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. He taught us not to be selfish, not to go around boasting and not to go around bragging, right? We, we saw that about our charitable deeds, right? He taught us that there is a certain way that we are to carry ourselves. There is a certain way for us to live, okay? He taught us that we can't be self-righteous in our living, right? He told us that we needed to follow his example. All right. That is the way in which we are to live. All right. So that's the reason for the season, right? The reason for the season is Christ. All right. He revealed a whole lot to the world. All right. And we must be attentive to everything that, that Jesus shined a light upon. All right. We must receive it. We must take it in. All right. Like I said, there are many who have received. Right. And at the same time, there are many more that choose to either ignore the sounding of his horn, as I said in my sermon last week. And then there are others that choose to complain. All right. And so we'll see Paul. We'll see him as we transition now over to the fifth chapter of Ephesians. We'll see Paul where he speaks on on our receiving of the light, because there is, as y'all hear me say all of the time, there's something that we are to be doing. All right. Now that we who are of sincere faith have received the light, we we are walking in the light. There's something for us to do. And Paul, he tells us there in that that first verse there in the fifth chapter of Ephesians, where Paul, he says, therefore, be imitators. That's what it says in the New King James Version. It says, be imitators of who? Okay, be imitators of God as dear children. What does it mean to imitate? What does that mean? Okay, hold on. I got a bunch of answers there. All right. Okay, to act exactly like someone else. All right. In this case, who are we to be acting like? You get there we go. All right. So we are to be imitators of God. All right. So think about that for a moment, because this is a good one, right? When we go out there and we cuss somebody out, are we acting like God? When we go out and we are greedy, we don't want others to have. All right. Are we 
Are we acting as, are we acting like God? No. No. Okay. So we'll see Paul. He said there in the second verse, he said, and walk in love. All right. There's that word again. Y'all hear me talk about this one all the time. You know, I, I really do need a counter somewhere in here to just count how many times I talk about how we are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Right. He said, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. So he said, Paul said, walk in love in the same manner that Christ gave himself for us. Do again, you realize today that you are to be giving of yourself. Now, was Paul telling us that we are to get on the cross? Okay. So how are we to give ourselves? By the way that we treat other people. people. All right. And, and again, you know, we can't, we should not be malicious, right? You know, if we go over to, let's see, let me make sure that we don't cover this. We stop at the sixth verse, don't we? Is it the sixth verse or the 14th verse? I can't remember. Okay. So we cover it. All right. So. If you actually take a look there uh, at the eighth and the ninth verse, you'll see where Paul he said, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. He said, walk as children of light. Then he said there in the ninth verse, he said, for the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. This gets us over. If, if you have your Bible and you turn over to the fifth chapter of Galatians, which I do for all of you. If you look at the fifth chapter of Galatians, you will see where, where Paul, he speaks about the fruit of the spirit, but he doesn't just talk about the, the fruit of the spirit. If you look at the 19th verse in the fifth chapter of Galatians, you'll see where Paul, he speaks about the works of the flesh. All right. And he said that the works of the flesh, they are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, decisions, heresies. He continued on. Paul just lifts off. A whole bunch of things there. He continued on in the 21st verse saying envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Paul said, these are works of the flesh that have no reason being a part of the child of God. Now, why don't those things have any reason of being a part of the child of God. Hmm? Why should selfish ambition not be a part of you? Why should contentions not be a part of you? Dissensions. Why should that not be a part of you? The answer is there in the first verse in our Sunday, uh, the fifth chapter there in Ephesians. There we go. We, we are to, again, be imitators of God. God doesn't move in that manner. God moves in a manner of love. And, and to break that word down, because the way that we look at love, we don't look at love as, as we ought to look at love. God's love is filled with compassion. He's sympathetic. He's understanding of our plight, everything that it is that we go through. All of our trials, our tribulations, the Lord, he knows it. He understands what we go through. Even in our temptations, when we fall down, when we err, when we transgress against him, when we trespass, 
The Lord understands it. He gave us his only begotten son who was tempted while in the flesh. He didn't sin. But again, he understands what we go through. And so we are to be imitators of the Lord who treated us with much care and treats us right with much love. So how should we treat each other? No, we, we talk about it being Christmas time, right? And so we shouldn't be going around being spiteful, right? Shouldn't be going around, you know, with all kind of anger and hatred pent up in us, all kind of maliciousness and wrath. We shouldn't be moving in in such a manner. Okay. And Jesus wasn't given to the world for us to move in that way. Right. Again, he taught us that when we move in that way, we are moving as a sinner. We're moving in disobedience of the Lord. So we shouldn't be moving that way. We should be moving as an imitator of the Lord. All right. We always say we are to be Christ like. All right. So, again, it's not enough for us just to say that we are to actually do that. All right. He said again there in the second verse, he said, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. Okay. We are again to move in a manner to where we uplift. That's what, that's what the Lord, that's what Christ did for us. We see there in the third verse, he said, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetous, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. That's just what we discussed in detail. Okay. We have to, to turn away from, from these sinful ways. All right. They don't fit the believer. Said there in the fourth verse said, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not again fitting, but rather giving of thanks. We are to give of ourselves once again. We are to give out of love. And then we, we've talked about this before as well. We are to be cheerful in our giving. And again, that verse that Paul wrote, it has nothing to do with the collection plate. We often like to get up in front of the church and say, God loves a cheerful giver. When we pass out the collection plate, that verse has absolutely nothing to do with the collection plate. And I wish that, that we would stop standing up in the church and quoting that verse when the collection plate is being passed around. God loves one who gives of himself to each other and does it cheerfully. And when you are unable to be cheerful in that manner of giving, the Lord has said, just stay sitting down. You see, there's nothing wrong with you taking a seat when, when you may be down in your spirit and you can't give cheerfully. You see, when, when, when you are unable to give cheerfully, but then you decide that you're going to give anyway and you're bitter in your giving, it does nothing to uplift anybody and it does nothing to glorify the Lord. So we have to learn how to give when we are cheerful, when we are able to give of ourselves. And like Brother Harris say all the time, when it doesn't hurt, that's when you should be happy, cheerful to give. And then we'll see there again. He said there in the fifth verse said, for this, you know, that no fornicator, unclean person or covet covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. We know that the wicked, those who are of the way of wickedness, we know that they are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. How do we know this? Because again, the Lord gave us his only begotten son who revealed this truth to us. Paul isn't making anything up in this scripture here. The only thing Paul is doing is doing what I do when I look at Jesus's teachings and I share it with all of you. That's all Paul was doing there. All right. So he said there in six verse said, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. There are many people 
who again would look at this scripture here and would look at what Paul said are the works of the flesh in the fifth chapter of Galatians, starting there in that 19th verse going through the 21st verse. And they would look at it and they would go, man, what's so wrong with being greedy? Because they live by greed. They want to gain and gain and gain. They want to have and have and have. There are many people today that want to be rich in worldly possessions, in worldly riches, right? But again, they'll look at this scripture and again, the, the darkness can't comprehend this light. Because it sounds like foolishness to those who are of the darkness. Which is why when, you know, you hear me say it all the time. I don't care for, for money. I say that all the time. And there are many people that will frown at me saying that. You know, they say, oh, they, you know, they talk about, they, they like to, you know, kind of mock and scoff those who say, well, money can't bring about happiness. They say, oh, no, I'm going to get my money. I'm going to go on vacation. And I'm going to... I'm going to post all my selfies on Instagram and on Facebook with a big smile on my face to to show people, everybody that I'm happy. But then the vacation is over and what happens? You got to go back to work. Like like we said, you know, there, there are many people today who are chasing after the riches of this world and it's again like grasping for the wind can't hold on to it. It's all temporary. You know, you, 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 your, your hunger has to be filled again. Whereas we saw in our first lesson, when it came to learning contentment, when, when you go to God, he's going to satisfy your soul. Okay. He's going to give you peace of heart, which is again, greater than anything that this world may be able to give anyone. So like Paul said that don't let no one deceive you with empty words. You know, those who love to live according to, to the world and the world's doctrine, they, they are bigger preachers than the preachers of God. You know, there, there are many people preaching in the world today that they have their own sermons. They, they may not craft the sermon as I do, you know, all week long, I craft my sermon and you know, they, They're able to stand up in the crowd and they're able to say, hey, if you do as I do, then you'll get rich. You know, they they write their books out, you know, do as I do. You'll get rich. Follow these things that I do. Follow these things that I say. You'll get rich. And there are many people that go out and they buy these books. They play they play their videos on YouTube far more than they'll ever play my videos, you know. And they'll try to, to follow those steps, those, those methods, and it's like grasping for the wind. They're happy for a moment. They may be rich for a moment. Then they aren't satisfied. They have to go out and have to gain more and more and more. Okay. And so Paul is said there in the seven verses said, therefore, do not be partakers with them. We have been sanctified by the blood of Jesus. Okay. The the birth of Christ was for us, all of us who are of sincere faith, to be separated, to be set apart from those who run from the light. Okay. We are to walk in the light. We are to remain in the light. All right. Now, again, something happens. All right. When when we walk in the light and we are taking on all of that light. All right. There's something that we are supposed to do. All right. Now, what are you supposed that we are supposed to be doing when we're taking on we have resided in the light of Christ and we did so for nearly all of our life. What are we supposed to be doing in the world? That's spreading the love of God. You know, when you, do y'all know how the, we, the, the moon essentially works for us at nighttime. 
You know, and it, does the moon generate light itself? Yes. Y'all think so? Yes. So y'all think the moon radiates? What if I told y'all that the moon is just a dead rock in the sky? And all it does is it takes on the light from the sun and it reflects it back to us. What if I told y'all that's how the moon works? Because that's how that's how it actually works. <laughs> it, 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 it ain't radiating no light. The moon is just a dead rock. OK, it, it, it's taking on light from the sun and that light that we see from the moon is coming from the sun. That's all you see is light from from the sun bouncing off the moon down onto us. Guess what? All right. We are taking on the light of God and that light. We should be pushing it out, reflecting it, you know, on the world. We are to be lights in the world. That's what Jesus said. We are to be lights in the world, letting our light shine for all of those who are in, in the dark, all of those who are in sin. Paul, he tells us there in eight verses said, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Right. He said, walk as children of light. And he said there in the ninth verse, he said, for the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness, righteousness and truth. Now, again, if we go over to the fifth chapter of Galatians and we take a look at the 22nd verse. We'll see there in that scripture that to the Galatians. Paul said that the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. He said there in the 23rd verse, he said that the fruit of the spirit is also gentleness. It is self-control against such. There is no law. When we talk about the fruit that we bear, the light that should radiate, that should shine from us. This is what should come from the believer. Again, Jesus, he was given to us. He was born to teach and to train us in the way to go. And in the way in which he trained us to go again was for us to, to love. We are to be a blessing. And so Jesus, he said again, uh, what we see here with Paul, Paul said that we are to, again, bear fruit or light, if you will, that is of love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and everything else we see Paul say there in the 23rd verse. Okay. And so, again, that verse, it sounds very familiar to what we saw Paul say there in, in our scripture here where Paul said that the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Okay. The, the fruit of the spirit, it ain't in acting out of selfish ambition. It ain't in lust. It ain't in covetousness. Okay. So, so again, we, as God's children, we have to be imitators of the Lord. We have to walk as Christ walked. All right. Can't walk like the sinner. All right. So we'll see. Paul said there in the 11 verse, he said, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Again, we are to be a beacon of light in the world. Okay. God did not give his only begotten son for you to again, see the light, step in the light and then walk in the light, but not be the light itself. Does that make sense? See, there are many professed believers that like to say that they are a Christian. They like to say that they are a child of God, but then you look at their actions and everybody looks at their actions, both believer and non-believer. And they see that they walking kind of strange. So we ain't supposed to be walking kind of strange, are we? All right. He said again, have no fellowship. What do we say? A fellowship. What do we say? Fellowship is from the first lesson. 
Where does fellowship? I'm looking at y'all three. What, what? Okay, relationship. You know, it's a relationship. Okay, so it said, have no fellowship. Don't be in relationship. Don't have a relationship. Okay, with the unfruitful works of darkness. Okay, we, we ain't supposed to be friends with sin. <laughs> you a child of God? What you what you doing being a friend with sin? That don't look right. <laughs> that that don't look right. Paul said, "Expose it. Don't don't be a friend with it." You know, many of us we are afraid to to expose sin. You know, we're afraid of what sin will do to us. We 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 don't want nobody to to, to harm us, right? But we're supposed to be in fellowship with God, right? That's what we saw in in learning contentment, right? And, and whatever it is that we go through. In whatever state we are in, all right, we are to be in fellowship with the Lord, trusting in the Lord, not being anxious about anything. You can't be afraid to expose, to shine a light on sin. You see, when 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 you when you expose sin, when you shine a light on sin, it actually shows that you love your neighbor. You know, it's like that old that lesson that you learned when you were growing up. Your parents got on you because they love you. If they didn't love you, they would just let you keep on doing what it was that you was doing. Deanna smiled, so she must have got on, been got on a lot. My, my, my sister Lori. Oh, and we got an amen now. No, I'm in the same boat. You know, if, if my brother was here, he'd be able to say the same thing, you know. You know, our parents got on us because they loved us. They wanted us to go in the way that was right. All right. So if you love somebody and you see them doing something that, again, you know, is disobedient to the way of God, what it is that pleases the Lord. OK, you will rebuke them. Let them know that they are doing wrong. OK, don't play ignorant to what they are doing. OK. We see there in the verse Paul said, for it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. The 13th verse, Paul said, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light for whatever makes manifest is light. All right. This, this is how we show that we really are a child of God. When we are revealing the divine truth. Not in subjective, not in objective, but the divine truth to all of those that are around us. And like I said earlier this year when I was preaching about keeping it real with ourselves, before we can ever expose the divine truth or reveal the divine truth to those that are around us, we have to reveal it to ourselves as well. So like I said in the sermon in October, we have to confront ourselves first as well. Like, like Paul has said there about keeping things in secret. <laughs> we keep a lot of things in secret. That, that's where our sin lies at. But we have to confront that ourselves as well. Okay? So that we can grow. So that we can mature. So that we can also be able to understand what others are going through and be able to help them out. Okay? That is how we are supposed to, to move. OK. And again, Paul, he said there again, there in the 13th verse, he said, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light for whatever makes manifest is light. And there in the 14th verse, therefore, he says, and this is the Lord that says, this is Christ that says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. We talk about the Great Commission all the time, all right? We talk about it all the time. Our task, our responsibilities as a child of God. Our responsibilities as a child of God is to be a watchman on the wall. As I said in my sermon last week, we can't be afraid to play our trumpet. Now, I know somebody somewhere is gonna say, I don't know how to play a trumpet. I ain't talking about physically playing a trumpet. I still know how to blow a trumpet, okay? 
But the trumpet that I'm talking about is a spiritual trumpet. You can't be afraid to speak up. <laughs> That's why God bless you with the ability to be able to communicate. You know, if, if you are unable to speak, you know, you may have a disability, a handicap. You know, people can do sign language. I, I haven't learned the skill of sign language. Okay. But there are many ways for us to communicate. You can write down. All right. Again, awake you who sleep. That's our message to share with the world. All right. We are to tell the world to wake up, turn on the light. It's, it's like, again, going into that dark room and just flipping on the light switch. And, it, and if they try to cover themselves up and, and hide from the darkness and they say, hey, I don't want to hear it. Guess what you're supposed to do? You ain't supposed to just turn away, walk to the next person and turn on the light for them. Okay, we, we let the Lord deal with those that say, oh man, I'm just throw the covers over my head. One way or the other, God will get to them. Okay, so we'll see our message there. Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead and Christ will give you life. That is a message of repentance. It is a call to repentance. Okay, that's, that's the same message that Jesus had for all of us. Turn away from sin and arise from the dead. That's what that means. Turn away from sin, turn to the Lord. Paul said, arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. That's what, again, we share. And again, if we remember what John said in the first chapter, in that the first through the fifth verse, he said that the light was the life of men, right? That's what we have to impart to all of those that are around us. Life. We're not talking about physical life. We're talking about eternal life. Jesus was given to the world for the purpose for all of us to be able to inherit eternal life. That is the reason for the season, the light of Christmas. Okay. All right. So that is our Christmas Sunday school lesson. Do any of us have any questions or comments? Thanks for watching this week's Sunday school lesson. I hope that you enjoyed this lesson. I hope that you'll share this lesson with someone somewhere. Now, if you haven't done so already, I ask all of you to, to follow our channel. Be sure that you follow this channel so that you don't miss a Sunday school lesson, so that you don't miss a Bible study, so that you don't miss a sermon or a food for thought. Be sure that you are following this channel today.